Thank you, teams. Um, and we have a couple of speakers joining us online as well. So I'd like to um, ask um, the Deputy Permanent Representative for Colombia's mission to the United Nations, Arlene B. Tickner, to give some opening remarks. Thank you so much. I'm timing myself because I find that in a space um, such as the CSW that should be not only gender, sens gender sensitive, but feminist um, and respectful of the use of time so that everyone can speak, <laughs> it's not always the case. And so I like to time myself to not go over. Let me just second the thanks um, for the organizers of this event. Um, it's a fundamental topic. Um, and I, I, I think it's at the center of the conversations that we should be having um, about about women um, uh, and criminalization in, in, in events such as the CSW. I um, just want to talk for very briefly about the current Colombian government's approach um, to, um, to the differential penal treatment of women um, in, um, in instances of, of, of activities related to drugs and other minor crimes. Um, this idea of differential penal treatment, and I, I'm not sure if I'm saying the words correctly in English, I have to tell you, because I'm not, I'm not an attorney um, and I'm translating from Spanish, um, even though English is my native language. Um, differential penal treatment um, is a concept contained initially in our 2016 peace accord um, and, and basically sought to benefit um, any number of marginalized social actors from small scale farmers, um, indigenous um, populations, Afro-descendant peoples, women, rural communities um, and whatnot. Um, in particular, um, in, in the rural parts of the country, um, convicted of drug related crimes um, uh, uh, and, and, and as part of the ethnic chapter of the accord. And, and I see this as, as a first step for thinking about not, on, not only alter, alternative sanctions, but a restorative notion of justice, which is at the heart of the current government of Gustavo Petro's approach to total peace. So this is basically the starting point for, for this, this new idea about how to address um, drug related and other crimes um, in a different way. Um, and when the government was elected um, one and a half years ago, the National Development, the National Development Plan as well introduced um, this notion of differential penal treatment with a gender and intersectional approach in, in cases that present factors of vulnerability. So basically what we have today is this law passed last year, um, Law 2292, which I assume some of my co-nationals will be talking about, which I believe in English would be called the public utility law, but not sure, um, in which basically the idea is to um, provide um, alternative community services um, in drug-related and other crimes for women, head of family related to drugs and others um, with um, sanctions of eight years or less, um, with an eye to um, exercising um, their, 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 their jail time in another way. So the idea here of public utility service is non -paid, a non-paid work exercised freely in favor of communities through NGOs or, the pub or public institutions through a restorative approach um, that allows women sentenced to complete their sentences through community service in their communities to restore the harm done. Um, a gender sensitive approach in the sense that community service is accompanied by recognition that the harm done in the framework of, of the harm done occurred in the framework of gender related um, risk factors and seeks to overcome these um, and is a focus specifically on women heads of family. And there's a whole number of exclusions, in particular crimes committed that make use of children are not eligible for this alternative type of sanctions. Um, and basically, I assume that my colleagues are going to talk you through this. Um, there have been a number of NGOs that have now offered uh, specific numbers of spaces for these alternative sanctions um, to be completed through community service. Um, this is a process or a work in progress, um, I would say, in the sense that it is just starting to take off. And I think if you look at the numbers, there are approximately 2,000 slots available for women um, in prisons in Colombia. Um, the population adds up to 
6,029. 6, um, basically, uh, 37 a bit more percent of women in prison are there for drug offenses, so would be eligible for these alternative um, types of, of service. Since it's just taken off, the numbers, when we see them, potentially won't be too impressive. Um, I think there's a whole question, and on this I'll end, of socialization, um, training of judges and communities in general in, in terms of how to access these alternative sanctions. Women in, you know, who, who may be eligible may not know as well. So I think that's one of the challenges that the government is currently working through with an eye to providing these alternative um, these alternative. Um, types of, of, of sanctions um, through community service. So I will just end there um, by saying that I think this is, again, fundamental. Um, our government is working very hard to provide a restorative lens um, to specific types of crimes committed. Um, and, and, and we are hopeful that we are going to make progress in the two and a half years that are left of the government. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will hear a bit more about this particular law um, from a speaker from the Ministry of Justice in Colombia later in the panel. Swati uh, Mehta, who is the Director of Pathfinders, please take the floor. Oh, just for the interpreter, you need to put the... Hear about countries who are thinking about, you know, intersectional issues and, and how criminalization uh, affects poor women. I think it was as a very young student when I first came across this quote from Anatole France, and all of us would have probably heard this, you know, the law in its majestic um, equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets and to steal bread. And, and there are two things of note in this very ironic aphorism, you know, laws can and do forbid conduct which should not be forbidden. And they often place greater burden on some than, than on others. Because who, after all, would be sleeping you know, under the bridges or, or begging in the streets? In many countries across the world, we continue to see these anti-vagrancy laws, right? Um, those that criminalize loitering in public places or, or begging. There are other laws which end up targeting and criminalizing poor women. These could be single moms unable to pay hospital bills after childbirth, or those who may be charged with criminal negligence because they couldn't afford childcare. There may be others who are unable to pay traffic or housing code violation fines. In short, if they had money, they would not be in prison. Again, for a large majority of people, this not really so funny one-liner is an apt description of their interaction with the justice system. And it goes, uh, well, I can never find justice, justice can always find me. Um, and, and that is so true for many, many poor people in their interactions with, with the justice systems. And these ordinary people are seeing examples after examples around them, where people who have resources at their disposal seem to be getting away literally with anything. These could be multiple indictments without spending a day in prison, producing faulty planes that crash and kill people, or creating virtual platforms that incite violence or, and, or facilitate child exploitation. And I'm not saying that rich people should be imprisoned without due process or that companies should not be treated as a legal person, but it is time, I think, to examine the root causes of the current crisis, which is of absolute lack of trust in institutions and legal processes across the world. And the reason we are seeing this increasingly polarized societies and divisive narratives all across the world is primarily because institutions and systems are failing to deliver for the large majority of people. Those who are at the margins of the society, poor women, children, minorities, those living with disabilities, rural communities, laborers and farmers struggling to get their voices heard. Justice, as the UN Secretary General in his report on our common agenda said, is an essential dimension of social con um, contract and trust. And injustices lie at the heart of mistrust, strife and conflict that we see around us. As we gather today on the sidelines, and yes, it should not be sidelined, um, of the CSW, the event seeks to focus on impact of laws and policies that criminalize women due to poverty, and seeks also to share some promising practices. It will highlight the importance of taking a people, or in this case, a women-centered approach to justice. 
I would also like to place this in the 2030 agenda context and the discussion today here lies at the intersection of SDGs 1, 5 and 16, poverty, gender and gender equality and rule of law and access to justice. It's very much in line with the themes of this year's CSW and the upcoming UN high level political forum, both of which are focusing on poverty. Also recalling that the high level political forum this year is reviewing SDG 1 and 16 on poverty and again, rule of law and access to justice. We do hope that the discussions today inform these fora. So without much further ado, let me end by thanking governments of Canada, government of Canada, the permanent mission of Columbia to the UN, the United States for supporting this event and to PRI and Women Beyond Walls partnering with us to co-organize this event. Um, and thank you to OSF for kindly hosting this, providing us this space, and to all of you for joining us. I look forward to the rich discussion. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you so much for setting the context, both of you. Um, in this space, we see more and more um, brave, courageous activists, women who have themselves experienced criminalization and or imprisonment and um, the the justice system. And two women um, are here today, which we're really, really honored. And we know they're super busy as well. So we thank them. Um, one is in Colombia, hopefully on video, um, Claudia Cardona from Mujeres Libres Colombia, excuse my pronunciation. Um, she will speak online um, in Spanish with interpretation for us. And we also have the honor of having Cheryl Wilkins sitting here with us. Cheryl is the co-director of Columbia University's Center for Justice, and both members, uh, both are members of the International Network of Formerly Incarcerated Women. Claudia, please uh, take the floor when you're ready. Bueno, buenas tardes. Eh, primero quiero agradecer por la invitación y tener en cuenta eh, la experiencia desde la privación de la libertad. Es muy importante para nosotras que nos tengan en cuenta en estos espacios porque fuimos nosotras quienes hemos vivido todas estas vulneraciones a derechos desde antes de llegar a la cárcel, durante el, la estancia en la cárcel y al salir. Como lo dijeron, mi nombre es Claudia Cardona, soy una mujer que estuvo en prisión, soy cofundadora y directora de la Corporación Mujeres Libres en Colombia, una organización de mujeres que estuvimos privadas de la libertad y que decidimos unirnos para trabajar por los derechos de las mujeres que aún siguen en prisión, de quienes han salido y las familias. Eh, también, pues como la, ya lo dijeron, integró la red internacional de mujeres anteriormente encarceladas. Nosotras hemos tenido que sufrir de manera directa la problemática y las vulneraciones a derechos, además de los efectos de la criminalización en nosotras mismas y en nuestras familias. La criminalización de la pobreza, lamentablemente, es un fenómeno que se presenta en muchos países y es, un ref y es el reflejo de las desigualdades socioeconómicas, sistemáticas y la discriminación de género y la falta de acceso a recursos básicos arraigadas en, nuestra estructura, en nuestras estructuras sociales y legales. La pobreza y la marginación social generan un contexto propicio y abre el camino hacia la prisión. En muchos casos, las mujeres son empujadas hacia la delincuencia como una forma de supervivencia debido a la falta de oportunidades educativas, laborales, económicas y sociales. En mi trabajo en Colombia, he conocido mujeres empobrecidas que deben enfrentar una serie de desafíos y desesperadas por conseguir el sustento para alimentar a sus familias o para acceder a servicios básicos, se ven obligadas a buscar medios de subsistencia como lo son las actividades ilegales, como el tráfico de drogas, el hurto y otros delitos. Un ejemplo de esto es el caso de una compañera, una madre soltera de tres hijas y dos hijos que vive en un barrio marginal, que después de perder su empleo, ella se vio obligada a vender drogas en el barrio para conseguir dinero y alimentar a su familia. A pesar de sus esfuerzos desesperados por sobrevivir, ella fue condenada a cinco años de prisión, que además de ser una condena desproporcionada, 
la sumergió a ella y a su familia aún más en, la, en el espiral de la pobreza y el estigma social. Esto le pasa a ella, así como a la mayoría de las mujeres que llegan a, a la cárcel. Es esencial reconocer que las mujeres históricamente hemos sido castigadas injustamente, tanto por lo que hacemos, por lo que no podemos hacer. Por un lado, hay mujeres que han sido juzgadas como malas madres si los hijos e hijas no están adecuadamente alimentados o cuidados, a pesar de las limitaciones impuestas por la falta de oportunidades y la falta de garantía efectiva a los derechos. Pero por otro lado, cuando se intenta buscar medios alternativos de subsistencia, en este caso recurrir al delito, porque no hay más, son rápidamente criminalizadas y condenadas. Precisamente la ausencia de oportunidades las han dejado sin otra opción más que enfrentarse a un sistema que las margina aún más. Además de la criminalización, las mujeres han sido condenadas socialmente por transgredir los, re, los roles tradicionales de género impuestos por la sociedad patriarcal. Esta doble condena, doble carga de estigma y exclusión también perpetúa un ciclo de marginalización y sufrimiento. No podemos desconocer que la pobreza está estrechamente vinculada con otras formas de opresión como la discriminación y la violencia basada en género. He visto casos en los que las mujeres son víctimas de sus parejas, sus familias, también por el sistema de justicia, lo que las empuja aún más hacia un ciclo de pobreza y criminalidad. Mujeres que están en la cárcel porque sus parejas las comprometieron en situaciones ilegales, y recuerdo muy cercanamente a una historia de una compañera de Mujeres Libres que estuvo en prisión, por cuatro años porque su pareja le dijo que recogiera un dinero para pagar el arriendo y ella necesitando ese dinero fue a recogerlo y en ese momento la capturaron. Pero ella no sabía qué pasaba. Tuvo que dejar a su familia, a sus hijos menores de edad, pagó un delito que no planeó y que además de todo fue víctima. Sumado a esto, la pobreza también afecta la capacidad de las mujeres para acceder a la justicia y a programas de apoyo después de haber estado en prisión. La compleja red de la criminalización de las mujeres en situación de pobreza no se termina al salir de la cárcel, sino que persiste. Al salir, nos encontramos con una realidad terrible, como la ausencia de oportunidades laborales, educativas, sociales, la continua amenaza de la violencia, la carga incesante de seguir ejerciendo roles de cuidado sin respaldo necesario y el tener que enfrentarnos a, a discriminación y estigma. Sin embargo, y a pesar de todas las circunstancias adversas, la sociedad y el sistema continúan imponiendo expectativas y exigencias sin proporcionar el apoyo adecuado ni garantizar los derechos fundamentales. Todo esto dificulta nuestra reintegración a la sociedad, y perpetúa el ciclo de marginalización, pobreza y exclusión. Es necesario reconocer que la criminalización de las mujeres por su condición de pobreza no solo es injusta, sino que también perpetúa el ciclo de marginalización y desigualdad. En lugar de abordar las causas subyacentes de la pobreza y proporcionar apoyo a recursos de las mujeres en situación de vulnerabilidad, nuestro sistema de justicia penal castiga y excluye aún más. Es fundamental abordar las causas de la pobreza y las desigualdades estructurales de manera integral si queremos prevenir la entrada de las mujeres al sistema penal. Esto requiere un enfoque integral que aborde las desigualdades estructurales y promueva el acceso equitativo a oportunidades y recursos, así como abordar las injusticias estructurales que perpetúan la marginalización de las mujeres en nuestras sociedades. Esto incluye la implementación de políticas públicas que garanticen el acceso al empleo digno, educación de calidad, servicios de salud, vivienda adecuada, entre muchos más. Que en sí es garantizar derechos. En, en última instancia, abordar la pobreza como una causa fundamental de la entrada de las mujeres al sistema penal es esencial para construir sociedades más justas, equitativas e inclusivas. Para, miti eh, pues para mitigar en parte todo esto, desde hace un poco más de cuatro años, Mujeres Libres, 
junto a otras organizaciones de la sociedad civil, junto al Comité Internacional de la Cruz Roja, empezamos a trabajar en el proyecto de ley sobre alternatividad penal para las mujeres, lo hablaban anteriormente, el servicio de utilidad pública, y este proyecto de ley se trabajó teniendo en cuenta nuestra experiencia de privación de la libertad. Luego realizamos incidencia en el Congreso de la República y ante la Corte Constitucional para que todo fuera aprobado. Ahora celebramos que nuestras voces fueron escuchadas y que desde hace un año fue sancionada esta ley y se encuentra en proceso de implementación. Sin embargo, hay que seguir hacer seguimiento para que las mujeres no vayan a ser instrumentalizadas y además que se implemente una política para la salida de prisión, ya que al salir, como ya lo dije anteriormente, no hay oportunidades para las mujeres y se siguen vulnerando derechos. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia. I think you explained the issue so clearly and succinctly. Um, and putting uh, women into prison for poverty um, is illogical. It's not effective. It definitely doesn't uphold human rights and it's just so harmful. Um, and I also note your example of how um, lived experience in policy making is really essential. And I think that's something that we are calling for more and more that policymakers actually meet people who have experienced the laws that they're affecting and, and how to kind of like take on those experiences is, is an area where we all need to improve on. Cheryl, I invite you to take the floor. Um, thank you. Um, and good afternoon, and it's a pleasure uh, to be with you all this afternoon, and particularly during Women's History Month. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Again, my name is Cheryl Walker. I'm a co-founder and co-director of the Center for Justice at Columbia University, uh, where we committed to ending mass incarceration and the criminalization of advancing alternative approaches to justice and safety through education, research, and policy change. Center for Justice was created by two formerly incarcerated women, uh, the late, great Kathy Boudin and myself. We took the ethos and the theory we developed while incarcerated at Bedford Hills Correction Facility and created CFJ because of our strong belief, not only in the power of education, but also in the power of education systems, colleges, universities that shape minds and ideas and enact social change. We believe that dismantling the system of mass incarceration and criminalization creates pathways to justice rooted in healing, prevention, accountability, and equity requires a multifaceted interdisciplinary approach that is led by those who are directly impacted. Relevant to the question how poverty uh, drives the criminalization of women of color, I just want to take this moment to honor Judith Johnson, a woman who was sentenced to 22 years on a manslaughter charge, a woman who suffered mental illness, a woman who supported and cared about her community and Bedford Hills Correctional Facility, a woman who chose death over spending another day in prison. Judith Johnson committed suicide uh, a few days ago. Sleep in peace, my sister. You are now free. In the U.S. society, carceral punishment remains a driving force in the creation of solutions to address poverty and, and, and inequity created by race, gender, and sexual orientation. A punishment first and only solution has devastating consequences on families and community, in particular, Black, Brown, Indigenous, queer, trans, and poor folks. The punishment paradigm is exported across the world and poor people are affected globally. On a recent trip to Kenya at the Beyond the Bars Africa con conference, 
I was in a room with over 200 formerly incarcerated women, most who had been incarcerated for petty crimes, trying to feed their children. And I just wondered, if they could not feed their family and their children, how could they pay a fine? How could they? They were on a road to being incarcerated, for sure. I had a similar experience in Mexico City and in Bogota, Colombia, which my friend uh, Claudia just spoke about. I was in a room full of women who took turns one after another, telling their stories on what landed them in prison. And there was this, a lot of head shaking because we all understood what each other was saying, even when the languages were at least 10 to 12 different. We understood what it meant to be a woman and being incarcerated. And it didn't take us to have interpreters to understand the head shaking. We knew. You know, a large percentage of the root causes was homelessness, food insecurity, poor health and mental health services, domestic violence uh, situations, none of which was taken in consideration. And the thing is that you're going to hear that over and over again. You know why? Because it's not just in the United States. It's not just in Bogota. It's, it's all over the world. So, yeah, what are we going to do about that? So um, this indicative of the violence that we consent to, violence that we tolerate in the name of this is what keeps our community safe. And this is what justice looks like. Our movements for justice have made some progress in challenging punishment-centered policy, practice, and culture. This has been much more difficult when it comes to violence against women and issues surrounding interpersonal violence and community violence. Changing how we respond to violence will require challenging and ending balance of the state first while building up systems that support our most vulnerable people. It requires reckoning uh, simultaneously with the historic and current harms of the state violence that have been codified in carceral systems of oppression. It requires reckoning with how racialized punishment of the carceral state has done more harm than good. It means learning from and with impacted communities that are rooted in solidarity, self-determination, and dignity for all people. While movements for justice uh, have made some progress, we still have a long way to go, unfortunately. In fact, uh, uh, we are, I'm having a conference like in another week, and, and our theme this year is focusing on justice beyond punishment. You know, alongside community activists, scholars, and organizers, we will explore the struggles uh, to challenge carceral punishment while highlighting and advancing non-punitive approaches uh, to interpersonal and community violence. Um, and uh, that offers us ways out of the punishment paradigm. Folks, it ain't going to be easy. It's not. But we have to figure this out together. That's why I'm appreciative of this panel and this conversation. We need more avenues uh, to think collectively uh, from all of our vantage points. If we are to break free of carceral systems and as the primary and often times only the only tool in the toolbox. I would like to leave us uh, with what I learned from the women I work with here and abroad. And each say, if we lead with our divine purpose, we are the tools that can change uh, the world for the good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, it's very moving. And I think dismantling the system and kind of, I love that word because it's exactly what we're talking about here. And at PRI, you know, traditionally we've worked on non-custodial alternatives to imprisonment for women, and we're moving beyond that now. We're we're needing to like stop, you know, this whole cycle. We need to stop the criminalization and we need to look at the laws that are causing the global prison population to rise year on year. And the women's and in, um incarceration rates are rising year on year much faster than men for men. And why is that happening? Women are not becoming more criminal. The, the stats are clear. 
Um, so, you know, there's, there's a big problem here. Um, and that takes me to our next panelist, um, because research and the kind of data and, and what we know is really key to fighting this cause. And so I'm happy to ask Sabrina Matani, founder of Women Beyond Walls, who will be sharing some findings from ongoing research that we are doing together around um, why women, um, well, about criminalization of women due to poverty and status. Sabrina. Thank you so much, Olivia, and thank you to all for coming to this event. Um, you may not know it, but this is the first ever side event on the criminalization of women at CSW. And it's a shame that such a vital topic um, is only having this event now, but I really want to thank all of the co-organizers um, for supporting it, and especially to Cheryl and to Claudia for really kind of courageously sharing their experiences. Um, as we know, poverty is not gender neutral and women are overrepresented amongst the poor. In 2002, uh, sorry, 2022, the UN uh, estimated that 388 million women and girls live in extreme poverty compared to 372 million men and boys. And women are also um, not actively engaged in the labor force and the pandemic has exacerbated this gap. So really there is a, a feminization of poverty. And with Penal Reform International and as part of this campaign to decriminalize poverty and status, we started uh, out saying we want to actually map some of these laws that criminalize women due to poverty and status. And so I'm going to try in a very short time <laughs> to briefly highlight some of the uh, research that's ongoing, but also to invite you, if you uh, are working on issues, you have information you'd like to share, please actually let, let us know and to kind of uh, hopefully engage all of you when the report is finally out as well. Um, if we could move to the next slide. So the first um, kind of key aspect that has come up, that we've come across from our research is obviously the criminalization of life sustaining activities and informal economies. Um, and as both, you know, kind of Claudia and Cheryl have, have stressed, many women across the world are arrested due to economic pressures. Um, and many laws that might appear gender neutral, such as theft, for example, they actually have a disproportionate impact on women. Um, in England, the majority of women who are incarcerated have been convicted of theft or related nonviolent crimes. For example, women arrested for stealing bread or nappies for their babies. Um, in England, this might surprise many of you that many women, about 70 um, 6% of women uh, convicted in 2020 were convicted for not paying their TV license due to the rising cost of living. So again, you know, we have to really ask ourselves, like, why are we putting women behind bars uh, for these minor offenses and for these survival related offenses? Um, but we see this in, in many different forms. Um, I'm, I'm British Zambian, so I, I kind of have an eye on, on Africa and, and Europe. In Kenya, 67% of women who are interviewed actually in a report by PRI said they had come into contact with the law because they were trying to earn a living and support their families. And many were arrested for selling um, alcohol without a license. And they said they can do this because they could do it at home. So it was an activity they could actually do while taking care of their children and they could access good on credit. And so many women, of course, have challenges accessing the formal economy and accessing loans. I worked and I had a, the privilege of working in Sierra Leone for many years. And many women were arrested under a 1916 law for debt, so owing money. Um, and we, we say, you know, as, as sort of Cheryl said, poverty also impacts women's ability to access justice. So they can't pay a fine. They can't actually have a lawyer. They can't pay for bail. And research has shown that if you have access to legal representation, you're much more likely to be able to have uh, an alternative to imprisonment or actually just not even to, to sort of have a charge. So poverty keeps women in this continual cycle um, of criminalization. We could please move on to the next slide. So the next uh, kind of element that we've seen from our research is these offenses of vagrancy, loitering or idleness, for example. Um, and these are um, often very colonial laws that, that are still on the books and they're very vague and arbitrary and they give law enforcement, you know, huge ability to actually um, extort bribes uh, to kind of um, 
uh, sort of really victimized uh, kind of communities already marginalized, for example, women of color, migrant workers or sex workers. Um, if we could move on to the next slide. This is a, a quote from a, a sex worker in Sierra Leone. Um, she said, the police treat us like slaves. When they catch us, they beat us, drag us, so we have to bail ourselves. If we don't have money, they have sex with us before they leave us. If we have anything valuable, they take it. Uh, and Sierra Leone still has um, a Public Order Act 1965, which is a colonial law. Uh, with this law of loitering is so broad. <laughs> um, it says uh, anyone who is in the open air and not having any visible means of subsistence or not any good count of, account of himself can be deemed an idly and disorderly person and be liable to imprisonment, which is very broad. Um, I am very pleased to say that Sierra Leone absolutely has plans to decriminalize these laws, and I'm grateful that Mr. Vandy is here, who will be speaking more about some of these positive efforts. But um, these laws are, are in many different countries, even in the US, for example, some states have loitering laws. And again, they really target women of color. They reinforce mis misogynistic views. A woman might be arrested because of what she's wearing, because she doesn't look like she could be a woman of good repute. And also trans people are particularly mm -hmm. impacted by these laws as well. We could move on to the next slide, please. Um, another element that has come through in our, our research is the criminalization of homelessness. Um, and many women um, are homeless because of issues around mental, mental health, poverty, also abuse. There's a very strong link between male violence against women and homelessness. And so this criminalization is almost a form of double victimization and creates these really vicious cycles of abuse. Um, it can be very challenging for women when they leave prison to have anywhere to go to. Sometimes their families might abandon them. Many countries don't have sort of any support for when a woman leaves prison. And so many women will find themselves homeless as well. But instead of receiving support, instead of receiving any kind of help from the state, uh, they can be criminalized for kind of homelessness or related behaviors like sleeping rough, public uh, bathing or begging. The UK currently is has a proposed criminal justice bill, which contains new powers for police and local authorities to enforce this so-called nuisance rough sleeping. These powers include being moved on, a fine of up to £2,500 and even imprisonment. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and drug-related offences, um, have a particular and disproportionate impact on women. 35% of women in prison worldwide are in prison for drug offenses compared to just 19% of men. And this is much higher in regions like Latin America or Southeast Asia. And women are really rarely ma major players in the illegal drug trade. Um, but the increase in women's imprisonment for drug related offenses is often attributed to attributed to the greater ease which which they can be arrested for these low level crimes and prosecuted. Whereas mostly the men who are actually these high level kind of players in the drug trade remain um, kind of outside and, and outside of, of justice. Um, and so actually, you know, these punitive drug laws are not doing anything to kind of solve some of the root causes. Also, many women who are convicted for drug offenses are foreign nationals. For example, in Malaysia, 95% of women on death row are there for drug trafficking offences, and 86% of these women are foreign nationals. Um, one of the cases of these women is Mary Utami, who was a grandmother and former migrant worker, and she was on death row for almost two decades in Indonesia. She was convicted for illegally importing drugs into Indonesia. She grew up in poverty, and she was in an abusive marriage. And she was actually um, groomed and manipulated by a Canadian man who invited her to go on a trip to Nepal. He gave her a suitcase lined with heroin. Um, she had no idea about this. And then she herself was arrested. And she's only been released due to a big civil society campaign to have her pardoned. Um, but these are the stories uh, of, of women who kind of end up being in prison, sometimes uh, for very serious offenses on death row, simply due to poverty and to trying to make ends meet. Um, but there's also women who have um, who are drug users and who are drug dependent. 
and 50% of women uh, are in prison, uh, sorry, 50% of women in prison as opposed to 30% of men are estimated to experience drug dependence in the year prior to imprisonment. But instead of having a sort of harm reduction approach where women can be supported and given you know, treatment and help, uh, in, instead they're often uh, imprisoned. There is some good news in that there is a big move to sort of, you know, decriminalize drug offenses and to take a much more harm reduction approach and countries like Portugal are good examples, but we definitely have, you know, a very long way to go. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is, oh, thank you. <laughs> this is um, another case of a, a woman from Colombia um, who she um, was actually a, a single mother and she turned to drug sm smuggling to support her child. Um, and she was actually arrested for and sentenced to 12 years in prison um, because she was um, discovered with cocaine on her where she thought this, this was marijuana. And this is often like a common tactic that, you know, couriers will use um, to sort of, you know, kind of get, get women to do uh, the sort of drug smuggling. But there has been um, some positive impact. For example, in Costa Rica, there's been a very targeted reform of laws on smuggling drugs into prison. Um, and they've given reduced sentences for women. And I think this is a good example of having kind of gender responsive law reform because they realize that these sorts of laws actually have a much disproportionate impact on women. So what can they do to sort of really support? Um, I have to say that this is like a huge topic and I really can't do it justice, but I uh, want to call out um, Coletta, who I'll embarrass her, but she has the lovely orange top and she's done a huge amount of work in this area with Wolo and others. So if you really want to unpack this issue, please speak to her later. I'm just merely trying to highlight it. Um, and if we could move on to the next slide as well, please. And also in our research, of course, is criminalization of sex work. Many countries still criminalize um, sex work. And of course, um, economic um, kind of, you know, survival really drives many women uh, into to sex work as well. But the criminalization of sex work has been found absolutely worldwide to make sex work as much more vulnerable to violence and much less likely to report the violence they face. And it prevents them from accessing healthcare and other critical services. Um, and again, these laws really target some of society's most vulnerable groups and marginalized groups like trans women, women of color and immigrants. Next slide. Thank you. Um, as you'll see, there's so many other offenses, which unfortunately I don't have time to go into, but there are so many laws that has come up as part of our research around morality crimes, policing women's bodies. Uh, for example, in, in the Middle East, adultery or wearing uh, moral clothing, women can be arrested for this. Um, but this doesn't just, you know, this happens in many other contexts. In my own country in Zambia, a woman was arrested two years ago for indecent dressing. Um, and sometimes, even though we may not see huge numbers of women arrested, we also have to think about what's also the sort of paralyzing impact on women as well when they have these laws. Um, it, abortion, uh, for example, in the UK, uh, just last year, a woman was controversially jailed for using drugs to induce a medical abortion during the pandemic. Um, if we look at Latin America over the past two decades, more than 180 women in El Salvador have been jailed for murder for having an abortion after suffering obstetric emergencies. In at least 20 countries, suicide is criminalized. So the, there's a whole host of laws that we don't even really know about. And um, one of the big struggles I have to say that we found absolutely in our research is having all of this information and really seeing this impact on women and particularly kind of the, the gender focus. Um, last, last slide, <laughs> thank you. And so some of the recommendations that are coming out of this research that we're doing is definitely this, you know, we, we absolutely need much more data. We need more data from a gender perspective. It's it's really hard actually to even get data on what women are in prison for. Um, but the research that we need, it has to be participatory. We have to be speaking to women with lived experience and getting their perspectives about how these laws impact them. It can't just be desk research or you know things like that. And but that needs resourcing. 
And so we really need a lot more investment in that. Of course, absolutely, we need to decriminalize these laws. And I'm pleased that there are now kind of, you know, a lot more kind of regional recommendations around this. And But we need a push. Um, even a, a country like Sierra Leone, which is, you know, really positively saying it, it will um, kind of decriminalize its petty offenses, which is really great. And there's lots of other good examples. But it just takes time. It takes time to kind of go through parliament and to do that. So we also need to have more kind of... Um, and more of a, a watch of this, but also more encouragement to make sure that, that this, these laws are being decriminalized. We absolutely need more funding for this work. Um, I'd really encourage you to go on Women Bureau's Wall's website and read our Forgotten, Funders, uh, Forgotten by Funders report, which highlighted just the lack of funding for work with and for incarcerated women and girls. 70% um, of the organizations we interviewed didn't get any funding from women's rights or human rights donors. And so I ask us here, if we're at CSW, we're talking about women's equality and gender empowerment, but actually there's a, a huge group of women that are being left out. At the Generation Equality Forum, the issue of women's incarceration was not featured. There was not one woman with lived experience there, nor at Women Deliver last year. And this is like the one side event far away from the UN that is happening. This is not to discourage us, this is to empower us. I think there's so much more we can do if we kind of really join together. And I really uh, encourage you all in whatever position or power you have that next year and next year CSW, absolutely, let's make sure that this issue has much more attention and many more side events. Um, we absolutely need to invest in much more access to justice and legal empowerment for women and girls. This is really critical. And lastly, much more investment into community support. Research has shown just how harmful prison is, not only for women, but for their children. Children who have a parent who's incarcerated are much more likely to have mental health issues, much more likely to end up in prison themselves. Whereas actually community support services are shown to be much more effective. Um, and not only reduce the societal impact, but also the financial cost on the state. In the UK, it costs £50,000 to put a woman in prison. It costs £4,000 to support her in a women's centre where she can be in the community with her family and be supported. But the UK government intends to build 500 more prison places for women. So um, this is, yeah, absolutely, you know, um, something that we, we need to absolutely make much more of a priority. Um, thank you so much. That was really a whistle stop tour, but please do, <laughs> please do follow uh, PRI's website, Wimbry and Walls, and, and hopefully you'll get a copy of the report coming out soon. And absolutely, please let me know if you have anything you'd like to contribute as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabrina, also for your leadership um, on this issue. I think one point I wanted to pick up on was we've, we're talking a lot about petty offences or like minor offences, let's say, but um, poverty is also driving criminalisation when you're talking about serious offences for women. Um, PRI has done research on women who have fatally attacked or killed their abusers after very serious long-term domestic violence. And we were shocked actually that in law and in practice, there's no consideration of this violence either in terms of their culpability, but even at the sentencing stage. Um, and there was a couple of like, let's say promising practices where the law had been changed to, um, take battered woman syndrome which is like a medical syndrome um into the law to say judges actually have to you know get a report to see if this woman had you know I don't even think a report was needed but regardless of that and so I think even when we're talking about serious offenses um you know the stories we're hearing tonight especially around like drug trafficking you know there's always almost always a story of violence and discrimination underpinning that and the justice system is just not considering that at all. Um, so we're just going to um, skip um, to Annie if that's okay because um, the director from Columbia is running late. Um, so thank you Annie for joining us tonight. Annie Hudson-Price is senior counsel um, at the office for access to justice with the US Department of Justice and she's going to share um, some information around initiatives to strengthen access to justice for women in this context. Thank you, Annie. Thank you so much. And uh, I, you know, before I dive in, I want to express my appreciation for the centering of impacted voices in this. It's phenomenal, not something we see often in these spaces. So um, 
and thank you to Ms. Cardona and Ms. Wilkins for sharing your stories. Um, so the Office for Access to Justice is a standalone component within the Department of Justice that plans, develops, and coordinates the implementation of access to justice policy initiatives of high priority to both the department and the executive branch. Um, our mission is to ensure that all communities have equal access to the promises and protections of our laws. Our office also supports U.S. efforts to implement UN Sustainable Development Goal 16, and we represent the United States before international bodies focused on access to justice. Um, so I've been asked to speak about laws in the United States that have the effect of criminalizing poverty and how those laws specifically impact women and girls. I'm also going to speak a little bit about the work of our office and work that has been done um, across the U.S. to address some of these harms. Um, before I do that, though, I want to stress my recognition that um, there are significant gaps in U.S. legal systems and there is much more we can be doing, um, including listening to our fellow stakeholders and colleagues across the, uh, across the globe. Um, so there are two, two topics I'm going to focus on given my limited time, uh, both of which you've heard some about already today. Um, the first is fines and fees in the criminal legal system, and the second is criminalization of homelessness. So starting with fines and fees. Uh, across the US, courts have come to rely on fines and fees for both revenue and punishment. And to briefly distinguish between the two, fines tend to be upon sentencing as a form of punishment. Fees tend to be, can be assessed for anything depending on the jurisdiction for actually accessing a public defender to um, having to pay for the room and board for jail. Um, to standard, you know, across the board, anytime you come before this court, you're going to need to be assessed a fee that will go towards the education fund or will go, go towards the police fund or um, across the board. When fines and fees are assessed without consideration of an individual's financial circumstances in the United States, it can have a devastating impact on an individual's life. Um, while a $500 fine or $200 in fees may be an inconvenience if you're affluent, if you are low income, it can mean choosing between paying rent, feeding your family, um, or you know having significant court debt. And if you cannot afford to pay the fine or fee, if you fail to pay the fine and fee, uh, the ramifications, both direct and indirect, can escalate very quickly. Uh, for example, in some jurisdictions, individuals who are unable to pay court-assessed fines and fees can face snowballing financial penalties, extended justice system involvement, suspended driver's licenses, and unnecessary incarceration. The indirect consequences can be even more devastating, including losing homes, losing employment, losing voting rights, and even custody of one's children. Um, these policies can force justice-involved individuals further into cycles of poverty and can increase counterproductively the likelihood of recidivism and further justice system involvement. So how do fines and fees impact women and women in particular? Um, so the first thing I want to stress is regardless of who the fine or fee is assessed against, the vast majority of court-related costs, including fines, fees, and bail bonds, are shouldered by women, um, in particular women of color, often female family members of the accused or the incarcerated individual. This reality has the effect of pushing women further into poverty, which in turn can make women increasingly vulnerable to the cycles of poverty and criminalization. Um, the, also, the collateral consequences I briefly alluded to before of inability to pay fines and fees can be particularly devastating to women who disproportionately bear the burden of caring for children and dependent family members. Uh, so to give an example, currently about the half, half of the United States, uh, states in the U.S., um, will suspend a driver's license for failure to pay a fine or fee, regardless of the nature of the underlying offense. And women with children or elderly dependents are often relied upon to get their family members to school, to necessary medical appointments. They are often the sole breadwinner, and so they need their license to get to their own job um, to ensure that their benefits appointments are made. And when a license is suspended based on unpaid court debt, these women are forced to choose between meeting these necessary obligations to their families while facing further criminalization because if they are stopped for driving on a suspended license, that can lead to arrest, it can lead to additional consequences, and it can also lead to additional fines and fees. Um, they're forced to choose between that and leaving their family members without ability to access um, 
these necessary services. So fines and fees have been a particular focus for the Department of Justice. Uh, in April of last year, we issued a the Office for Access to Justice and some of our colleagues issued a at the Civil Rights Division and the Office of Justice Programs issued a dear colleague letter to state, local, and juvenile courts regarding the imposition and enforcement of fines and fees. The letter cautioned against the assessment of legal system fines and fees, which may be unlawfully or racially discriminatory, or may unfairly penalize individuals who are unable to pay. Um, then in November of last year, um, ATJ, the Office for Access to Justice, issued a follow-up report expanding upon the principles set forth in the letter and highlighting some of the most common and most innovative fines and fee approaches to reducing the harms of fines and fees that are taking place across the country, along with concrete examples of implementation at various levels of government, including international examples from Canada, Kosovo, and a few others. Um, the, the report I just referenced addresses 12 categories of promising practices that jurisdictions are employing from eliminating certain categories of fines and fees altogether to implementing meaningful real ability to pay determinations, regulating debt collection, discharging existing debt, and even reimbursing fines and fees that are collected illegally. Um, the report also includes a section addressing specific approaches jurisdictions can take to reduce the unintended harms of juvenile fines and fees, which can be particularly disruptive to families. Um, it, and it highlights the many jurisdictions that have stopped relying on driver's license suspensions or have implemented alternatives such as you know, restricted licenses for people who have to take their children to school or to uh, medical appointments. Uh, again, this is only the beginning of the work that needs to be done. Uh, so the second issue I wanted to focus on was uh, criminalization of homelessness. As the homelessness crisis grows in the United States, jurisdictions across the country increasingly have been relying on the criminal justice system to address its effects. These efforts are often counterproductive, further entrenching unhoused individuals in cycles of debt and criminalization. Um, for example, laws, you know, we've heard about life status offenses, life-sustaining activities, laws that make it a crime to sleep in public or in your car, even when you have nowhere else to go. These laws can present unique challenges for women. While men make up the majority of the unhoused population in the United States, uh, the Department of Housing and Ur Urban Development has found that women represent over 60% of individuals and families with children that are unhoused. In jurisdictions that do criminalize acts associated with homelessness, the alternative to arrest is often to um, either stay in unsafe situ housing situations or to go to a shelter, um, a public shelter, and if there are even beds available. And many public shelters are unsafe for women and children, both for health reasons and for physical safety. Um, there are shelters that are segregated based on gender, which can help ameliorate the consequent the, the risk of sexual assault, but these shelters often produce alternatives, uh, alternative challenges, including they often have restrictions against women with male children, especially if they're over a certain age, like 12. So women with male children may be forced to choose between sleeping in their car or on the floor of a friend's already crowded apartment or under an overpass in order to keep their family united exposing themselves to the risk of arrest or financial pen penalties. Um, that's one option, or the other option is separating your family and surrendering your children to foster care. I also wanna emphasize, you know, unaccompanied in families, women are overrepresented, but the most likely popu um, unhoused population for a woman to belong to is unaccompanied minors, or sorry, unhoused populations, unaccompanied minors. Um, I shouldn't say women, I should say girls. Um, and unhoused girls are disproportionately likely, of course, to be the victims of human trafficking, leading to increased risk of criminalization despite being victims themselves. So there are steps the Department of Justice and local jurisdictions have taken to mitigate some of these harms. Uh, the DOJ has filed a number of amicus briefs, both in state and federal courts, um, most recently in the US Supreme Court arguing that a jurisdiction violates the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution when it criminalizes someone for the status of being homeless, for example, by criminalizing the act of sleeping in public when an individual has nowhere else to go. Um, and a number of jurisdictions have taken steps to address the criminalization of minors who have been subject to sex trafficking. Uh, just one example, the Star Court in Los Angeles County is a specialized juvenile court that provides holistic and multi multidisciplinary support to underage girls who have been charged with prostitution-related offenses. Um, and so in conclusion, I just want to 
thank the organizer of this this event again for drawing attention to the often overlooked intersectionality of this issue, especially in the United States. There is, to state the obvious, still much work to be done across both of the areas I highlighted today. And we look forward to continuing to partner with those in this room and beyond to ensure access to justice does not depend on wealth, sex, or gender. Thank you so much, Annie. And I think um, a takeaway from what you're saying is, you know, if if we can't kind of achieve decriminalization of certain offenses, I think there are measures, you know, that we are also documenting that can be put in place to mitigate or provide a stopgap, at least in some communities. Um, a couple of others that we know of is a kind of no, not, um, no prosecution policy around certain offences. So um, prosecutors have taken the lead and kind of saying, okay, that category and those kind of circumstances, we will not take those cases further. Um, and we also know of policies where women cannot be imprisoned if they have um, young children, or there has to be a very exceptional reason to imprison them rather than having prison as the default and then some, uh, you know, who might have access to justice manage to argue their case not to go to prison. Um, I'm going to turn to our next speaker who's sitting right at the end there. <laughs> um, Charles, Mr. Charles Vandy, who's the Deputy Chief Director of Protection, Ministry of Gender and Children's Affairs in Sierra Leone. Um, and as Sabrina alluded to before, there are some um, good initiatives and um, plans to share from your country around um, ensuring that poor women um, do not end up in prison continuously. Thank you, Mr. Bundy. Okay, okay thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> um, I think I'm the only male on the panel. It could have been the my Honorable Minister of Gender and Children's Affairs, who is also a female, but uh, because of competing engagements, apologies because she could not be here. And uh, the second thing I also need to mention is that uh, in Sierra Leone, we have two categories of people. We have the learned and the non-learned. Those that are learned are legal people. So I'm not a lawyer as well, just to make some few clarities. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, as we've listened to the um, issues that women face uh, in relation to um, how poverty could be a key driver to um, their criminalization, I think all of the presentations that we've had from the different panelists, I think uh, I am just coming to present an angle that we look at what Sierra Leone is offering and we intend to move towards that trajectory to ensure that uh, a lot of women can move out of those uh, petty uh, issues that we keep them behind the bars. Um, we are working, um, the government of Sierra Leone is working with uh, several CSOs and uh, uh, government agencies. We have, for instance, in 2012, we had a law called the Legal Aid Board Act. And that act basically came on board because of this petty criminalization to ensure that those who cannot afford justice, uh, that particular um, Legal Aid Board provides legal representation for them in court. So it's not just looking at uh, providing for uh, government lawyers, for people who can afford. But most of these cases that women who do not have at all and uh, for issues that are very minor, they are taken to um, court for, the Legal Aid Board provides free representation for them in Sierra Leone. Uh, there are some schools of thought who will argue, why is it that this person um, has committed an offense and government is providing service for them. So, but uh, that is the mechanism that is working. And uh, we also have uh, Sabrina used to work for Advocate uh, in Sierra Leone. Advocate also is a major advocacy uh, body that works in Sierra Leone to ensure that uh, they look into the issues of uh, 
women who are in our correctional facilities and see how uh, they provide some services for them from a human rights-based approach. We also have a group of female lawyers, the association we call lawyers. Lawyers also provide free legal aid and they have a lot of paralegals as well that engage uh, some of these uh, um, issues either from the police station level or at community level just to resolve so that some of these cases can be settled out of court before it gets to um, um, the correctional facilities. Um, for Sierra Leone, uh, there are several reforms that have been made and uh, it is also interesting to note that uh, we are still continuing to do our legal reforms just for us to ensure that uh, they become gender responsive. We are working currently on the 1991 constitution. Uh, currently, the constitution does not speak for everybody because there are entrenched clauses, which we call clawback clauses in that law, which does not favor anything for women. It's, it's, um, so we need to look at uh, the review. The committee is being set up, recommendations have been made, and we are looking at it because if it is the ground norm in, of the country, then you need to have it work for a population that is almost 52% of the country. So that is work in progress. The criminal procedures bill is also at an advanced stage just to ensure that you have a lot of guidelines looking at how to address some of these petty things so that they don't get into the former justice system through alternative uh, dispute resolutions and other things. We also um, um, did the um, radical inclusion policy uh, wherein pregnant girls can now return back to school because economic empowerment is a major thing that we need to look at. Um, women who are not economically empowered are more susceptible to violence and also in the way of retaliation, they find themselves in this, uh, in the heart of these criminal issues. Um, the Sierra Leone government actually in 2022 passed the Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Act, and that act also makes provision for women's access to finance, financial services, and financial products, noting that if women are economically empowered, some of these gender-based violence issues uh, against them will be reduced. And in that same law, uh, before I came, I spoke to the um, acting director general of Sierra Leone Correctional Services, because there is a provision that appointments, at least 30% of recruitment have to be women. So um, they have just put out an advert they are going to do recruitment. I mean, when you have same sex um, 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 providing services, it also improves on what you are doing. So um, I can tell you where the females are located within the special court facility in Freetown is of a more, much more uh, upgraded facility than where the males are actually placed in the old uh, facility. So all of these. Um, you have monitors. I remember two months ago, myself and my minister, we went to the female detention center and we were just interacting with a lot of them. What actually brought them to um, that kind of... Some of them are minor offenses, although some of them are uh, major offenses leading to murder and other things. But you begin to see some of them. We have a system where the president gives pardon and recommendations are always being made, advocate and the other partners, just for us to see that when presidential pardons are given, women on these minor offenses are actually given um, that kind of pardon. Um, we have the National um, Financial Inclusion Strategy by the Bank of Sierra Leone, and majority of what that document focuses on is actually ensuring that you have more women uh, benefiting from the financial service inclusion. So that by so doing, you have families empowered because poverty, you do research today in Sierra Leone, it will suggest that women are the poorest of the poor. And if they are poorest of the poor, thinking of their caregiving roles, then you begin to see how that um, um, is widening up. Uh, I was director of gender for one decade in my ministry. And uh, I can tell you, I now supervise the director of gender, but uh, I can tell you the director general of correctional services, each time they write me, they will suggest we have 
a pregnant woman who has been in our facilities and the reason for a micro credit uh, amounting to not more than $200 equivalent and that person is behind bars. So you begin to see when they get these micro credits, in fact now in Sierra Leone they term it as micro jail. You take it, if husbands realize that you have this money, I mean, school fees, no, just pay it. I will reimburse you later. Oh, house rent, just pay. I will reimburse you later. Um, lunch for kids and all of those things. By the time the time comes for repayment, you can be sure that they don't have the resources and the husbands can abandon them and they are being taken to um, um, prisons for those kind of minor uh, offenses. So, um, what we are looking at is uh, when poverty is on the increase, it also increases domestic violence. And domestic violence is one of the violence that is on the high side, much as we have a law um, um, actually criminalizing domestic violence. But then what happens is uh, because of the dependency issue in our country, I can tell you um, we hope we can shoot a video on the 22nd when we want to launch our gender-based violence information management system, a domestic violence uh, video, which is suggesting a female was violated by her husband. And I can tell you, she is now permanently disabled. She cannot even raise her hand to feed herself. Everything, she is now in a wheelchair. Everything has to be done. And when that matter went to court, she was crying profusely, who will look after my kids? Who will look after me now that I am in this state? So you begin to see when the dependency ratio is on the husbands, even to prosecute criminal issues against women, it becomes difficult. Some of them have overreacted and that has led to where they are today behind the bars. But I think this advocacy needs to continue if we are on the form of reviewing our policies, our legislations. And I think I can agree more with uh, Sabrina. This has to be a global call just to ensure that uh, we have um, more actions happening. Because if you are on a development trajectory like Sierra Leone have made the medium term national development plan, the question that we come, are you carrying everybody along? What about those minorities? What about those in prison? What about those in those categories whose voices cannot be heard? So we need to get along um, with everyone in our development trajectory, including those females that are uh, serving sentences and we can find, make their lives better. So um, uh, for Sierra Leone, I think uh, these are the few initiatives that we are doing and the uh, if there are questions, I am always prepared to answer. Thank you very much and look forward to very exciting discussion. Thank you very much, and especially for the call um, that you made at the end. We have one more speaker who's joining us online, um, Mr. Diego Olati, who's the Director of Criminal and Penitentiary Policy at the Ministry of Justice in Colombia, and he's going to give us a bit more detail about the law that was mentioned, um, around, which has provided for more possibilities for alternatives to imprisonment for women. Hopefully we can connect. Bear with us for a minute. Here we go. Thank you. We can see and hear you. Yes, good. Thank you. Okay. Um, me permitiré hacer esta presentación en español. Empiezo por agradecer, por saludar y agradecer a los a, a quienes invitaron al Ministerio de Justicia de Colombia para presentar una ley que se sancionó en Colombia el año pasado y que es una buena noticia en el mundo de la alternativa al encarcelamiento y en el mundo de la política criminal con enfoque de género. Esta ley 
que fue luchada por muchas organizaciones sociales de activistas alrededor de las negativas al encarcelamiento, activistas alrededor de los derechos de las mujeres, eh, lograron desde hace algún tiempo esta victoria que tuvo dificultades incluso para ser sancionada como ley y que afortunadamente coincidió la oportunidad de implementar esta ley en el tiempo que, que, que lleva el equipo de trabajo del actual ministerio y para mí es un honor liderar al equipo que eh, suma sus manos todos los días para implementar una ley que busca fundamentalmente crear un mecanismo para reemplazar la prisión con servicio comunitario para mujeres cabeza de hogar. Hice una presentación de solo un slide de solo una diapositiva y creo que resume una lucha de muchas organizaciones, como mencionaba, y una etapa, digamos, de un año de, de implementación. Esta ley, que es conocida como la Ley 2292 de 2023, eh, se creó en un contexto, y si quieren, miran el, el, este primer cuadro, en un contexto de un sistema penitenciario con las siguientes características. Colombia tiene cerca de 120 mil personas en, en cárcel, de las cuales eh, 6.600 son mujeres y, 40, y de las cuales el 42% lo están por delitos relacionados con drogas. Eh, este, este número de mujeres encarceladas por delitos de drogas pues es una realidad que la región latinoamericana y algunos países, particularmente Colombia, eh, tenemos desde hace, varios, desde hace varios años que la literatura especializada en esta región viene estudiando. Cuando, cuando se sancionó la ley y nos pusimos a implementarla, lo primero que hicimos fue un diagnóstico y aplicamos una encuesta a 400 mujeres. Tuvimos seis meses de, 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 para expedir un decreto reglamentario y en esos seis meses aplicamos esta encuesta. ¿Y qué encontramos? Eh, tres datos generales que, que dan contexto de la, de la situación de las mujeres en prisión. El 50% de las mujeres entrevistadas, eh, su edad media está alrededor de los 24 a 33 años, el 86% de, la, de estas mujeres no acabó, eh, las, eh, no, no, no acabó el colegio, digamos, la escuela, la formación básica, y los motivos, cuando se le preguntaron a ellas por los motivos principales por los cuales eh, cometió delitos, básicamente adujeron necesidades económicas para cubrir sus gastos, por ejemplo, comida, por ejemplo, manutención del hogar, entre otros. En el sentido, eso fue lo que originó todo un movimiento que dio con, con, con esta ley, que persigue un objetivo, si se quiere, principal que mujeres salgan de prisión, puedan realizar un trabajo comunitario o un servicio comunitario. La ley habla de un, de, de un servicio de utilidad pública, que es fundamentalmente un servicio comunitario eh, no remunerado como, y, y se erige como una medida digamos, restaurativa con un enfoque de género exclusivamente para mujeres. ¿Y qué requisitos entonces es, es, exige la ley? La ley exige ser mujer, ser cabeza de hogar, digamos, en una definición amplia que no es simplemente tener una pareja y unos hijos, sino pues puede ser un contexto más amplio con las múltiples interpretaciones muy fluidas hoy de lo que se considera hogar en Colombia, para que hayan cometido ciertos crímenes y esta ley aquí es necesario que se enfoca en el delito de drogas, en el delito de hurto, pero digamos... Dice, para todas las mujeres que hayan cometido delito de drogas, para todas las mujeres que hayan cometido delito de hurtos, eh, y si es por cualquiera de otros delitos, siempre que haya, siempre que la pena impuesta sea menor a ocho años, eh, y, que, y que además, digamos, se haya cometido delito en contextos de marginalización. Estas son, digamos, las cuatro condiciones concurrentes o que tienen que estar simultáneamente eh, dentro digamos, de los supuestos en que las mujeres van a solicitarlos. Si una mujer recoge, digamos, si una persona tiene estos cuatro requisitos, los cumple, puede solicitar el sustituto de servicio comunitario. 
¿Cuáles son las herramientas de implementación que hemos tenido para implementar esta ley? Creamos una, digamos, una estrategia de tres vías. Tres vías. Una, primero, una fase que se llama de inducción o de alistamiento, una segunda de vinculación y una tercera fase de ejecución. ¿Qué es la fase de inducción o alistamiento? Es toda la fase que transcurre en prisión. Necesitamos identificar a mujeres en prisión que cumplan los requisitos eh, para, para obtener el sustituto de prisión. Necesitamos asesorarlas jurídicamente. Necesitamos que formulen las solicitudes a los jueces y que estas solicitudes recojan no solo los, el cumplimiento objetivo de, los, de, los, de la ley, sino que lo puedan probar, que estén las pruebas para demostrar que es cabeza de hogar, que cometió el delito en contexto de marginalidad, eh, etc. Eh, en esto, por supuesto, hay unos aliados de diversa índole, tanto universidades privadas, universidades públicas, el servicio de defensa público o estatal también ha brindado y, y viene acompañando la implementación de estas medidas y aquí hay varios aliados que, 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 que tienen que ver en esto y a quienes les agradecemos. Pero una cuarta tarea adicional, o una tarea adicional en este punto de alistamiento de inducción es la socialización de la ley, que los jueces sepan que existe y sepan cuáles son los requisitos, que las mujeres también, que la autoridad penitenciaria también conozca la ley y cuando se le tramiten solicitudes y pasen por las oficinas jurídicas de los establecimientos, eh, se entienda... Eh, por qué se está haciendo este tipo de solicitudes y vayan a los jueces, digamos, sin, sin ningún problema. El segundo nivel de aproximación o de análisis que tenemos es, lo llamamos el match o la vinculación. ¿Y qué es esto? Es el punto crítico cuando está la solicitud para prestar servicio de utilidad pública porque la mujer cree que cumple los requisitos y el juez la concede. El juez dice si es una mujer que que puede, hacer, que puede realizar servicio comunitario y va a quedar en libertad. Cuando eso ocurre, necesitamos que la mujer en cinco días, después de esa, de, después de esa decisión judicial, se acerque a una, a, un, a una plaza de utilidad pública o una plaza de servicio comunitario. Y eso es básicamente que se acerque a una de las 10 u 11 organizaciones con las que ya tenemos convenios para que abrieron plazas de servicio comunitario para que las mujeres puedan eh, realizarlo allí. Eh, y este es, un, este es un paso que pareciera fácil, pero que la logística del sistema penitenciario colombiano y de el, la judicatura en Colombia a veces lo pueden hacer complejo. Y me refiero a que tenemos que... Eh, decirle muy bien a la mujer ¿a qué, a qué lugar va a ir a hacer servicio comunitario el enlace o el supervisor de ese servicio comunitario entonces tenemos que poner al juez en conocimiento de, de, de esta información específica alrededor del servicio comunitario y eso lo hace un sistema digamos es una herramienta que construimos para, para facilitar esto un sistema de información donde están todas las clases comunitario que las mujeres pueden a las que las mujeres pueden aplicar eh, dentro de la aproximación el jury approach que ponemos acá está el punto de la ejecución y es lo que pasa una vez la mujer sale de prisión le decimos que tiene que ir a, a una organización específica a brindar servicio comunitario y, el, y, y básicamente la ejecución es cuando comienza a ejecutar ese servicio comunitario ese servicio comunitario tiene dos reglas esenciales. La primera regla es que es de mínimo 5 horas, máximo 20 horas. ¿Por qué? Porque es un servicio no remunerado y hay una expectativa de que en paralelo a la ejecución del servicio comunitario, la mujer pueda tener un empleo, tener un rol de, de, de cabeza hogar, digamos, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. Y lo segundo es que este es un sustituto de prisión. Esta medida no suspende la ejecución de la pena, la sustituye. Y se sustituye, es decir, se tiene que seguir ejecutando. Y la forma de ejecución es el servicio comunitario. De manera que la regla que dice, la regla de, de, de ejecución de la sanción es que por cada semana de pena privativa de la libertad que me impuso el juez, yo tengo, yo tengo que hacer como mujer mínimo cinco horas. 
Esto quiere decir que si me quedaban un año de cumplimiento de pena, yo puedo hacer cinco horas semanales durante ese año, puedo hacerlo haciendo hasta 20 horas semanales para acabar en tres meses el cumplimiento de esa sanción. Eh, como decía... Como, como decía también Sorry, unos... Mr. Lati, I just have to ask you to wrap up if that's okay. Listo. ¿Cuáles son los primeros resultados de, de, de la implementación de, de, de esta ley? En el momento ya salieron 15 mujeres que están prestando servicio comunitario. Otras 15 mujeres están saliendo en los próximos días, que ya tienen una plaza reservada y, y, y ya van a salir. El, hay 2.300 plazas de servicio comunitario a través de 11 convenios que tenemos, en donde 11 organizaciones dijeron, yo quiero recibir a mujeres que están en prisión para que cuando salgan presten servicio comunitario en mi organización. 280 plazas se abrieron. Y hay cuatro equipos de monitoreo que tenemos distribuidos a nivel nacional para que eh, cuando salgan las mujeres podamos acercarnos eh, y vincularlas a toda una oferta institucional social que tiene el Estado colombiano a través de los municipios o a través de las, de las entidades nacionales. Esa es una coordinación que hacemos a través de estos equipos eh, de monitoreo. Esos son los resultados, digamos, hasta ahora de, de la implementación de la ley y aspiramos que este año terminemos con varias cientos de mujeres que al final en diciembre hayan recobrado su libertad para estar brindando un servicio comunitario como medida restaurativa eh, como alternativa de prisión. Gracias. Thank you so much for sharing um, a bit more detail about that initiative. Um, I don't want to stand um, <laughs> between the wine and, and, and drinks and food. <laughs> Um, but I just thought if you would oblige us another few minutes, would anybody like to ask a question or make a comment that they feel is they would like to share with um, the group? I think we've, um, so everyone wants wine. Yes, sure. All the panel. I, I, I don't, I don't want to speak. Yeah, I don't want to take up any time, but I do have just one. This, I, I just want to say thank you. I, this has just been... Uh, um, both both very um, depressing, um, but at the same time, very enlightening. And I just want to just make one observation. It seems to me just listening and particularly to the testimonies that we've heard from Claudia and Cheryl that this there's a state and a societal compulsion to punish um, that's rooted in gender, class, racism, uh, and whatnot, um, uh, which are, you know, suggest to me that we have to think about the structural sources of inequality, discrimination, and violence, um, if we are to be able to make the transition away from this, from this, from this paradigm. And so, uh, it's just something that I've thought about listening to you. Um, it suggests that there's so much work to be done, but at the same time, I'm so, I'm just so. Um, I'm so what affected affected positively by hearing these stories, and I just want to say, I, it's just it's just amazing, and my my hats off to you, and my deep respect. Any other thoughts from my right or my front, please.
Oh, oh, now, oh, see, see what happens. You open the Pandora's box, please. Thank you for this really insightful um, panel. I was wondering, as we see abortion um, uh, criminalization being expanded and also issues regarding um, sex outside marriage really affecting girls in many countries, how do you see opportunities to work with sexual reproductive health advocates around the world? Thank you. My name is Annie Mondi. I come from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I thank you all for the uh, valuable information and data that you've just shared. My, I just want to attract attention that everything that has been said here, women and girls are suffering from it, even more in the context of conflict. Uh, because in the context of conflict, access to justice is a problem. In addition to uh, any other criminalization that we get in the patriarchal uh, uh, society that uh, we live in. And I'll just join uh, Jenna on the, the, the issue of sexual and reproductive health and rights for women and girls. Thank you. Oh, sorry. First of all, thank you for putting on this panel. It was excellent um, and raised a lot of uh, issues. Um, I guess I do have a question or maybe a comment. One thing I've noticed, um, we saw it in the legislation from Columbia. Um, we certainly see it in many practices here within the U.S., which is that only certain offenses are eligible for these alternatives to incarceration, right? And every time it's always based on either it being a so-called minor offense or lower penalties. And in my sort of previous life, I was a public defender for tw almost 20 years. I know, and I think probably most of us know that particularly women and girls who are arrested for the more serious offenses and who are sentenced to higher uh, numbers of years in custody those offenses are even more typically related to some aspect of their marginalization, uh, being victims of some level of violence. And so sort of one of the um, challenges I always found in court was we would have judges, and of course the United States is, is notorious for having these mandatory sentences, but I think this exists in various forms in almost every country, which is that even when you have the judge, even when you have a jury agree that there was battered women syndrome, we're going to acquit the woman of first degree murder. Now she's acquit she's convicted of manslaughter. Everyone agrees, but she's not even eligible for any of the programming we're talking about versus the woman who, or the girl who is caught with a small amount of marijuana who absolutely should get the alternatives, right? This isn't about one versus the other, but I would love to start seeing the conversation shift from it being, you know, people arrested for these minor offenses should get this and it being more about people arrested with a sort of based in some aspect of marginalization or some aspect of, of duress being eligible because otherwise, ironically, the those who are the most impacted by the patriarchal systems, um, who are most likely to have been committing violence because of some sort of violence perpetrated against them, who are most likely to be trafficking drugs, which in the U.S. often carry mandatory 10, 20 year sentences, so they're not eligible. Those are the same very women and girls who are the most likely to have been the most impacted. So I would I'd love to sort of start hearing a paradigm shift into thinking more of the context as opposed to just the level of offense. I think you've just you've just formed a recommendation that's come out of this event. Um, and I'll exploit my um, moderator status to um, add one thought about the question about the um, links with yeah, sexual and reproductive rights work that I think we wanted to have this event at the CSW because there isn't enough work or like connections made with women's rights 
you know, whatever field it is and criminalization of women or women in the criminal justice system. And so I think that's one of our kind of purposes and we, we hope that we can make more of those linkages. And I'll give the last word to Sabrina um, and then we'll go and have reception and we can carry on the conversation. Thank you so much for all those really insightful questions. And I just wanted to respond um, a little bit. I fully agree with you that I think yeah, alternatives or like this conversation can't just be about minor offences. Um, so thank you so much for raising it. I think in the terms of the decrim campaign, this global campaign to decriminalize poverty and status, the entry point is like, let's start somewhere. And some of these laws that are on the books and, you know, particularly uh, impact women, these minor offences, they are actually easy to try and get off and if we can get them off that means we're like trying to reduce a huge number of women who become criminalized and I think that is sort of the entry point but you know absolutely agree with you and it's been as, as someone similarly as uh you know has worked a lot with women who've been charged with very serious offense, offenses women on death row I've been really pleased to say, see some small steps like in Kenya there was actually a, a woman who um, was not given any sentence at all because they did actually take into account the victimization and, and abuse that she had encountered. So I do think that we also need to push for more gender responsive responses. And that's why I think access to justice is so key as well. Like we can't only look at law reform if we're not looking at investing in the justice side too. Um, and I just really want to echo kind of what Olivia said is like when we talk about funding, it's not just about oh. Or like we, we talk about this issue not just being included. It's not just like, oh, you're not inviting us to the party. The problem is, is, is if women with lived experience and activists working on this space are not in these other spaces, we can't kind of share learnings. We can't share best practices. We can't form movements and we can't actually join up together. Um, you know, Women Deliver, which again, even though applications were made, there was not one topic on women's criminalization, but it was actually Women Deliver comes out of a sexual and reproductive health right space. So why are they not including this issue? So I think when we're, t when we're calling for this, it's because we want to form these linkages. We want to make sure we're looking at all women. Um, and I say that in its very broad, broad terms, but, but also, you know, we don't only live single issue lives, right? I think um, someone at another panel had said that. And so I think we need to kind of make sure that we're being broad and encompassing as well. Thank you. Can I just, Olivia, just say thank you to, to people who have not been acknowledged, Leah, oh Laura, Jero, behind the scenes. Thank you so very much, the comms team. Um, thank you so very much for all your support. Uh, yeah, without you, this wouldn't have been possible. Thank you. Thank you.